The Stanlib Industrial Fund uses the barbell approach to investing, balancing risk with equal weightings of defensive and cyclical stocks. The fund was the top performing industrial fund over one and five years as at the end of May. That's the 31st of May this year. For more, Theo Boerter, Portfolio Manager of Stanlib Industrial Fund, joins us in studio. Well, you're obviously doing something incredibly right. Tell us a little Thank bit you. about your strategy. Well, as I said, we, we like to sort of have shares that are defensive and also have cyclical shares and then you don't have to sort of swing the portfolio around too much when, when, when things change, especially now given the volatility in the market and, and the uncertainty around are we in a growth cycle, are we, gonna be, are we sort of going into a recession given the shenanigans of, of, of Europe, etc. I think it's easier to have sort of your, your, your foot in kind of two baskets. So we've got the defensive side and we've got some cyclical shares too. Um, now, if we didn't have all the retailers in our, in our portfolio or some of the retailers over the last two, three years, you know, our performance, I think, would be vastly different from what they are today. And, and, you, and you saw, well, you must have heard Sam saying, well, we know you've got Theo Boerter coming in and he's going yeah. to tell you about the industrial portfolio because Sam Hooley, of course, stays well clear of all the retailers. So he's missed the, the fabulous performance that you've enjoyed over the last three years. Yes, so, um, you know, retailers have done very well and they've done well because they've delivered the earnings. Um, and that's why they have the PE ratings that they have today. They have very good ROEs and they've delivered earnings. That might change in the future. And that's what I was gonna say. Is it sustainable? Because that's the big question, the million dollar question. I think um, with low interest rates the way they are now, I, uh, I think we think that the consumer has still got, got some legs to go. We don't see interest rates going up b before maybe in, um, in, in June kind of next year. So the consumer is still deleveraging at the top end of our, at the top end, consumers aren't actually spending money on their homes. I mean, because house prices are depressed, people are not investing in, in upgrading their houses because, quite frankly, they can't in many instances. So they're spending their money on other things. They've been buying new cars. Um, they've been buying other kind of durable things. And at the lower end, people are, are eating, um, supported by, by government grants, etc. So that's the underpin at the, at the bottom end. But you know, we like, we like the top end and the bottom end for various, for different kind of reasons. Okay, two bits of news flow that fascinated me. I think it was just about two weeks ago. Um, famous brands came out with their results. And the, one of the comments from Kevin Hedewick is people are eating more often, but spending slightly less. And then from Pioneer Foods, where they saw lower volumes. Yes. Now, how do you... How do yeah, you I take mean, that back to the yes, consumer? Um, I think what, I mean, Tiger Brands also, also mentioned that their volumes were down. But you've got to sort of take it and say, well, this is one company looking at their portfolio of products and their volumes are down. And I think the reality is that for Tiger Brands and, and Pioneer Foods, some of their products are just too expensive. So people are trading down. They're trading down from buying, a, um, potentially buying an Albany loaf. Whilst you're in pick and pay, you might buy a, a, a loaf of bread baked by pick and pay. That loaf of bread doesn't last four days. You have Those to white today. labeled products that yes. are generally cheaper across the board. Yes, um, so that's what happening. I think the same might apply for, for a famous brands. Um, you know, you are cutting back on your portion size because you're feeling a little bit um, under pressure. And remember, you know, maize, maize prices have been high, um, protein prices have been high, so um, people have had to cut back on the, on, 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 on the number or the kilograms of, of food you're eating because it's more expensive. Along the same vein, your top holding is AVI. Yes. Now, this is a diversified company. I know it well because of the Spitz offering and the shoes in that stable, although Ashraf thinks I don't know the shoes coming out. We're <laughs> going to have that debate later. They do uh, sell Prada, I'm sure, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. They've also just taken on a Green Cross. Yes. And then they've got the, the beauty care products yeah, and a food component. Yes. This one you really like. Yeah, because uh, it's, a, it's kind of a mini portfolio that we like because it's got defensive, it's got food. It's not really defensive food because it's selling biscuits and it's selling coffee and teas um, to, to a, a consumer that can, aff can afford to, to buy biscuits. We don't buy biscuits, you know, because we need to survive. We buy biscuits as a as It's a, a nice to have. Purchase. It's, an, it's, yeah. an, it's a nice to have. Yeah, so that sort of top, stop in more cyclical kind of consumer 
Um, tea, and, tea and coffee is more kind of stable consumer, but it's not kind of subsistence kind of food that we're talking about. It's more, more sort of uh, your discretionary food. They have the I&J business, which you know, is doing well now because the rand's a little bit weaker and, and they fixed that business and they're a lot more fish in the sea to catch, which is great. The Spitz business has been phenomenal for them. Think about that more like as a retailer. So they've been perfectly positioned in the retail kind of sweet spot with the kind of shoe offering that they had. And with the RAND strengthening over the last few years, they've, they've been able to, to get more margin out of, out of that business. And I think they understand the shoe business now. And that's why they've, been, they've bought Green Cross, which sort of adds to the leverage of that, that business. You add another brand into a kind of a system that works, and you probably just make more margin out of, out of that. With that going forward. Yeah. Theo, when you, you know, just to go back to, to the foods and, and consumers, where would you then be playing the consumer? I mean, outside of AVI? Woolworths. That's your second biggest holding. <laughs> yeah, I know this portfolio. <laughs> we love, yeah, we love Woolies too. And, and once again, they are selling food to a, the top end consumers. So for us, there's a little, a little bit less risk there in terms of pricing. So when a shopper goes into ShopRite, you know, he has to think, think a lot about what he's going to spend. Um, the, the, the cost of maize has gone up a lot, more than 30, 40%. So that, buy, the, that consumer is more constrained in what he's going to be buying. At the Woolies end, you know, it's, it's easier for those kind of shoppers to buy. What Woolies is doing, they, they're expanding their, their, their range, um, making it um, more attractive for their consumers. They're going into super, supermarkets. They've, got in, they've opened two of these new new um, supermarkets, one on Nickel Way. Um, that is, the, just as an aside, I, I went there this weekend by chance for a meeting. It is the most enormous store I have ever seen in my whole entire life. Do yourself a favor and go and check out Nickel Way. I think it must be the competitive offering to pick and pay yes. on Nickel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but and they've done a very good job. I really want you to not shop anywhere else. Just go into sh to release, buy everything you need there. That's a long-term kind of strategy to grow that. But they've also changed their, I think, over the last few years, what, what's really worked for Woolies is they've done a lot of work on their clothing side. Like Country Road yes. is now becoming a very, very popular upmarket brand. They're trading their clothing up exactly. rather than down. Which exactly. Is, but which uh, is but Theo, so what you're saying is that there has been very little movement in terms of the, the consumer that buys at Woolworths Foods and there hasn't been trading down by that uh, consumer. Yeah, you know, I, th I think, you know, um, these retailers, they've all got so many moving parts. At the, at the one end, is the, it's the resilience of the consumer. On the other hand, on the other hand, is these companies getting bigger and getting more operating leverage into their businesses, um, being more efficient, all going dis um, central distribution, which was pioneered by ShopRite in South Africa. So there's there are many things. I mean, the, the, the fact that the consumer has been healthy has been fine. Um, but below the, 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 the sort of turnover line, these companies have done enormous work to make their, their, their income statements grow. And I think that for us has been the driver. Going forward, I think the top line is going to be a little bit constrained. I mean, we're not going to see the kind of growth rates we had. But because interest rates are going, are stable, and consumers are deleveraging their balance sheets, I think that is a positive thing. We obviously need employment to, con to continue um, the kind of growth rates that we've seen. We also need r wages to grow in real terms. So those are things that we have to watch quite carefully. Um, yes, you, 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 is it my turn? I think it's my turn. turn. I think you've taken about three in a row. It's my turn. <laughs> SAB Miller yes. is another big holding. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course that comes with an entirely different story. Yes. But it's very emerging markets. There's a defensive element to, yeah. to SAB Miller because I think people are going to drink uh, Probably more in bad times, aren't they? Or, or, or is that a, a, a well, kind of frivolous assumption? They don't stop drinking. <laughs> they don't stop drinking. No. We like that because it, it, it's also defensive. It's global defensive. It's a RAN hedge. Um, they are growing fast in Africa and Latin America with emerging consumers. They also have portfolios that are not growing so fast in sort of uh, in, 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 in Europe where things are, are tough, but they've bought that business in Australia, so there's some opportunity there to, to turn around that business. But I, I think really for us, it's a defensive business. They've been a, a good management team. They've always been, um, been able to consistently grow their earnings. Um, and the ROEs for us are, are going up. So 
we parked that solidly and this is quite a it's kind of a bottom drawer stock you put it in there yes. you're not going to trade it in you're not going to sell it and in the global context when you look at global kind of defensive companies it's not expensive you have the final question for the night uh, Theo, what's your view then on the likes of Imperial and Bitvest in this part of the cycle? Because Imperial is obviously far more geared to the consumer, especially in terms of employment. And then, yeah. of course, Bitvest is somewhere between defensive yeah, and... Yeah, I, uh, I think, you know, Bitvest is, is more challenged, I think, because it's got businesses in Europe which are, 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 are sort of are struggling. I mean, no denying that. So um, of the two, I'd still say I prefer Imperial. They've got a great product offering. They've got entry-level cars right, which um, some of the other OEMs in South Africa haven't got right. Um, and once again, low interest rates um, for longer means people can afford to buy um, entry-level cars. I mean, you can buy cars now for 100,000 Rand at the entry level. And I think that supports our investment thesis on, on Imperial. There's just time for one more, and I had a 26-minute interview with uh, Stephen Saad, the CEO of Aspen, today. That's for our Captains of Industry show. It'll be going out next week. What an exciting story, and it just caught my eye that this is also within your your top holdings. In yes. fact, I think it's around about number six or so, number yeah. five. And uh, you can't but get caught up in the enthusiasm that Stephen puts on the table. And he refers to the fact that Sigma Pharmaceuticals, you know, all the merchant bankers were saying to him, no go, no get go, you really shouldn't be making this acquisition. And it really is doing incredibly well for them. There's no stopping yes. this company. Yeah. And uh, um, one of their B shareholders today sold some of their shares and there was huge demand for, for that placement. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great company. It's a... a um, Stephen Saad knows exactly what he wants to do with this business. He's growing across many geographies. Um, they source products, they come and make them in South Africa, so they get operating efficiencies, and the top line's growing, and, and you get those jaws of the operating efficiency op opening up. So, yeah, we really like Aspen. Theo, thanks, thanks so much for your time. Theo Bush, a portfolio manager of the Stanlib Industrial Fund.